Good morning, church. How are you guys doing today? Doing well? All right. It's great to see you. Great to be here today. Uh, Pastor Scott is on a well-deserved vacation, and so I'm uh, filling in for him, bringing the word today. Uh, my name is Chris. I'm, I'm uh, the discipleship pastor, and uh, I'm just really excited to be able to uh, uh, actually continue in this series in Romans that we've been in. Um, hasn't this been great? Like going through the book of Romans, I, I've just loved every single message. Scott has done such an amazing job, and uh, man, I've got some big fill, uh, shoes to fill today, so I'm going to uh, work on that for you today. So um, I want to just begin this morning with a little bit of a recap of where we've been in the book of Romans so far, and so uh, really what we're talking about here is this incredible letter that the Apostle Paul has written to the believers who were living in Rome. And he has never met them before. He writes this letter to them to explain to them the gospel, right? Right at the beginning, Romans chapter 1, verses 16 and 17, he pretty much lays out the thesis for his entire letter, which is the gospel, which is the power of God for salvation for those who believe. And at the rest of chapter 1 and, and chapter 2, he really lays out what Scott called this history of sin, this spiral downward that has been taking place since the beginning, uh, since the fall of man. And this spiral downward that has really led to the wrath of God that is coming against everybody. This wrath of God that is so deserved by every sinner. Well, then he gets to chapter 3. If you guys remember Scott's message on chapter 3, I, I was sitting right over here listening to the message. I was on the edge of my seat the whole time because it was the most incredible explanation of justification by grace through faith that I've ever heard. It was awesome because the Apostle Paul just lays it so clearly for us right there in his word that right here we see that justification by grace through faith really means that we are declared righteous. We are declared righteous before God. And so he spends chapter 3, uh, chapter 4, and chapter 5 talking about that idea of justification and illustrating all of that, okay? So then last week we jumped into chapter 6. And chapters 6 through 11 are really unique in the book of Romans because not, now that he's explained what justification is and what that means to acquire that justification by faith alone, now what he's going to do is he's, he's basically going to anticipate some objections to this, okay? He's going to anticipate some questions that may come up if someone who is reading this, uh, that, that they may have, okay? And so one of the things that he does, it's, it's, sort of, it's sort of like being in school. Like this is the point at which all, you know, if Paul is our teacher and we're all sitting in his class, this is the point at which all the hands go up. Okay, Paul. I get your whole justification by faith idea, but what about this? What about that? And the first objection was what Scott talked about last week. In Romans it's chapter 6, uh, verses 1 through 14, he really gets into this idea about having a license to sin, right? Like, can we just keep on sinning so that we can get more grace? That's, that's really the, 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 the question there. Because, because what Paul says earlier, he's, he says, you know, if we... If we keep sinning, there's more grace to cover it. If we keep sinning, there's just more grace. So why not just keep sinning? Why not just keep doing all the things that we shouldn't be doing, and then God's just going to heap more grace on us? Well, today we're going to get to a second objection, and the second objection is really similar to the first one, okay? But it's got a slightly different bent to it. So what I want to ask you to do, uh, go ahead and take out your Bible. You've got a Bible right there in front of you under the seat. And you can open up to Romans chapter 6, verse 15. And if you would, uh, please stand with me while we read our passage for today. This is Romans 6, 15. And we're going to go through verse 23. It says, What then? Are we to sin because we are not under law, but under grace? By no means. Do you not know that if you present yourselves to anyone as obedient slaves, you are slaves of the one whom you obey, either of sin, which leads to death, or of obedience, which leads to righteousness? But thanks be to God that you who were once slaves of sin have become obedient from the heart to the standard of teaching to which you were committed. And having been set free from sin, 
have become slaves of righteousness. I am speaking in human terms because of your natural limitations, for just as you once presented your members as slaves to impurity and to lawlessness, leading to more lawlessness, so now present your members as slaves to righteousness, leading to sanctification. For when you were slaves of sin, you were free in regard to righteousness. But what fruit were you getting at that time from the things of which you are now ashamed? For the end of those things is death. But now that you have been set free from sin and have become slaves of God, the fruit you get leads to sanctification and its end, eternal life. For the wages of sin is death, but the free gift of God is eternal life in Christ Jesus our Lord. Let's pray. Our Lord, this morning we thank you for the reading of your word and we pray that your Holy Spirit would actively help us to understand what you mean through your word to us. Help us to know it, help us to apply it, and we pray this in Jesus' name. Amen. You can have a seat. Well, Paul has a second objection and it has to do with license to sin, okay? has to do with this idea of like, well, why don't I just keep on sinning? But the objection is a little bit different because the reason for the license to sin is a little bit different. He's basically saying this. It's like, now that we know that all the consequences of sin have been eliminated, right? All of those eternal consequences of sin that would keep us away from God, all of that has been paid for by Jesus Christ. And so does that mean we can just do whatever we want? You know, as soon as, as, as I was thinking about this, there was a movie from the late 90s that came to mind. It was one of the most powerful, um, really existential movies uh, of our time. Maybe, you're, maybe you've heard of it. It's called Groundhog Day. Have you guys heard of that? Yeah? Groundhog Day is actually, it's actually a pretty brilliant movie, but there was a point at which the main character, uh, his name is Phil, and, and, and Phil, he's stuck in this loop, right? He's stuck in this loop where he's living the same day over and over and over again. And he realizes that as, because he's living the same day over and over again, that there are no more consequences to his actions. And so this happens. Go and check this out. Let me ask you guys a question. Shoot. What if there were no tomorrow? No tomorrow. That would mean there would be no consequences. There would be no hangovers. We could do whatever we wanted. Ah! That's true. We could do whatever we want. Ah! Hey, Phil, if we wanted to hit mailboxes, we could let Ralph drive. Oh, yeah. Oh, hey, hey, Phil. Stop. Hang on. It's the same thing your whole life. Clean up your room, stand up straight, pick up your feet, take it like a man. Be nice to your sister. Don't mix beer and wine, ever. Oh, yeah. Don't drive on the railroad track. Oh, Phil, that's one I happen to agree with. Sometimes I think you just have to take the big chances. I'm betting he's gonna swear first. And so he realizes that because all the consequences of his actions have been eliminated, he just is like, well, I'm just going to do whatever I want. Now, this is the problem that the Apostle Paul wants to address. He wants to get right down to this because the reality is, is that all those eternal consequences, all of the wrath of God has been absorbed by Christ. And so therefore, we are free from that. 
So why not just keep doing whatever we want to do? Why not just keep on sinning? Well, let's look at how Paul answers this objection. And in order to do that, we need to get a little bit of context. So back in your Bible, jump back to verse 12 in Romans 6. And look at how he ends the last objection. He ends it with a command. Okay? He says, Let us not sin, therefore, let not sin, therefore, reign in your mortal body to make you obey its passions. Do not present your members to sin as instruments for unrighteousness, but present yourselves to God as those who have been brought from death to life, and your members to God as instruments for righteousness. For sin will have no dominion over you, since you are not under law, but under grace. Now see, up until this point, we've been saying how he's been talking about this idea of justification by grace through faith, where we are declared righteous before God. With justification, we may not actually be righteous, but we are declared righteous before God, right? I think that Paul is actually changing topics here. He's adding another layer to what God is doing in our life. He's adding this layer that's called sanctification. Another big word. We're going we're gonna to explain that, so don't be intimidated by it. But the idea here is that God not only declares us righteous, but here in our life, he's actually beginning to make us righteous. He's beginning to purify us and make us holy, make us more Christ-like in our actual lives. Okay? That's sanctification. So let, here's a definition. This is... Um, from Wayne Grudem, uh, he says, sanctification is the process by which Christians are being transformed into the image of Christ. It is a continual growth in holiness throughout our lives. Now, a couple things about this. It is similar to justification in that the initial part of this actually happens when we put our faith in Christ. The initial part of this actually happens right when we are converted. And this is what Paul's point is, and we're going to get to this in a second. But the thing that's different about it than justification, you guys remember the chart that, that Scott put up uh, when he talked about Romans 3, that chart where it's like, you know, we're 0% righteous in God's sight, and then all of a sudden that conversion, it goes zoom all the way up to 100%. You guys remember that? And then that, and that's how it is. Instantly, with justification, we are declared righteous. But with sanctification, it happens a little differently. It comes across and it kind of goes like this throughout our life until death. And at death, we are freed from our sinful body. We are freed from, from all of that to where our sanctification actually shoots all the way up. And we are made completely righteous so that we can go into glory with God. Now, so it's different in that it's a process. It's a process that takes place over our entire life. It's also a little bit different because with justification, justification is something that God does, that God does in us, and we have absolutely no part in it whatsoever. But see, with sanctification, it is primarily a work of God. And we're going to see all the things that God does for us within sanctification. But it also requires some cooperation on our part. It requires us to actually listen to God and obey Him and do a couple things. This is why Paul in here has this command to not let sin reign in our mortal bodies, to not present our members to sin as righteousness, uh, uh, to sin as righteous instruments for unrighteousness, but to present ourselves to God as those who have been brought from death to life. So God is doing this work within us, but, but we have to sort of cooperate with it in a sense, okay? So that's sanctification. In order to totally understand what this whole process looks like, this growth in holiness looks like, we need to understand a little bit about what it means to be holy as well. Because I think for the most part, we may be sitting there thinking, okay, well, holiness, well, that's, that's really about like not sinning right? <laughs> like the first thing that comes to mind is, is, okay, I know I've got some sin in my life, some things that I do 
So really growing in holiness means I need to start like eliminating those things from my life. And that's, I think it's part of it. We may take it a step further and, and remember passages like Ephesians 2.10. And Ephesians 2.10 says that God has prepared in advance good works for us to do. And so part of sanctification includes that, that we would start walking in those good works that he has prepared for us. And I think that's part of it too. Some of you who maybe have been around the church for a while have, have heard this definition of holy, that it means to be set apart, right? You guys heard that before? Holy means being set apart, and being set apart is an interesting thing because as a definition, um, it definitely makes sense, it works, but it only works from our perspective because, because in order for something to be set apart, you have to compare it to something else, right? Like in order for something to be holy, then you have to compare it to something that is unholy. So for us who are, who are not holy, we can look up at God and say, God, you are so set apart from us. Or when we read like Isaiah chapter 6, when, when Isaiah sees God sitting on the throne and the angels around him cry out, holy, 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 that, that everything around him looks at God and says, God, you are holy because I am not. It's really a definition of comparison, right? But imagine this for a moment. Just th think about this for a second. Before all of creation... Before there was time and space and matter and energy, before there was anything around and all that there was was God, was God still holy? Well, yes, of course he was. God is always holy. And so if God is still holy when there's nothing else around, we can't say that he was set apart because there's nothing to set him apart from. And we can't take the members of the Godhead, our, our, our one God who is in three persons, the Father, the Son, and the Spirit, and try to set apart the three persons of the Trinity from each other because that would just be division within God himself, which is not who he is. Because God in himself is perfect unity, perfect fellowship with one another. He is one God in three distinct persons. And so, we can't use the word set apart. I want to submit to you that maybe a better way to understand this idea of holy is actually using the word devoted. Devoted. Now, why do I say this? Think about who God is. When all that there was was Him, that He, the one God in three persons, that each person of the Trinity was completely devoted to one another in perfect fellowship, in perfect harmony, in perfect existence with one another. And that even from that point, from the foundations of the earth, that God began to put into place a plan of action to create a universe that would be, and to create a planet that would be filled with people, and that he would want to reach down and redeem some people for himself. And as he does that, he put a plan into place at that point where the three members of the Godhead were saying, this is the plan, and they completely devoted themselves, each one of them, to the roles that they were going to play in accomplishing that plan in our life. That that is complete devotion that was happening even then. Well, does this work with other things that we call holy? Like, let's take items, just inanimate objects, for example. What about in the Bible? At the end of, of Exodus, uh, God commands the people to create a really specific object called the Ark of the Covenant, right? It's a box like this, and it's covered in gold, and it's got these two gold angels on top of it, and it's called the mercy seat of God. This is where God himself is supposed to show up. And they're going to take this box, and they're going to put it inside the curtain in the most holy place in the tabernacle. And then they were going to take the blood of an animal, and they're going to sprinkle this blood on top of of this box, of the ark. And then, and then as they do that, they say that it is being sanctified. It is being made holy. So can we say that this box is devoted to God? Well, yes. Because the, the ark of the covenant, as it is, it is completely devoted to the purpose of God. It is completely devoted to whatever God wants to use it for. So that makes sense. What about people? What about us in this sanctification process? 
Well, this is, I, I think it works really well. Because as we are being sanctified, it isn't just about growing in obedience and, and, and growing in like this process of not sinning and pushing sin in our life out, but it's also this process of growing in devotion to our God, right? It's growing in this devotion to Him where He becomes uh, everything to us, and we begin to realize that we have been redeemed for a purpose, that God has actually pulled us out of our sin so that we could be fully devoted to Him. I think, I think it makes a lot of sense. There's a pastor in the UK, his name is Sinclair Ferguson, and he says it this way. He says, holiness is an absolute, permanent, exclusive, pure, irreversible, and fully expressed devotion. This is holiness. Church, when we begin to understand holiness in this way, that it isn't, you guys, that it isn't this mechanical process anymore where it's just about not sinning and being obedient. I just got to follow the rules and be good little boys and girls and then everything will be fine. When we begin to understand holiness as being this idea of devotion to God, what we begin to see is that we're, we're really describing love, aren't we? We're really describing growing in love for the Lord. That's what we're saying. Think about all the verses in the Bible where the idea of love for God and obedience are inextricably tied together. Just as an example, John 14, 15, Jesus himself says, if you love me, you will obey my commands. Right? And so we have this idea now that as we grow in holiness, we're actually growing in devotion and love for the Lord. That's what it means to be, to be holy, to be set apart. Now, let's look at how the Holy Spirit inspired Paul to tell us about this in Romans 6. Let's break this down. And I want to do this by using a table to kind of diagram his argument, okay? I, I'm a visual person. I, I, I like seeing things like charted out. So, so this is what we're going to do. We're going to have a little diagram here. And the first thing that I want to explain here is that there's, in this first column, he's trying to explain the reality of our situation that we are going to have a master. We are going to have someone who we will be a slave to, we will be obedient to. Look at verse 16. He says, Do you not know that if you present yourselves to anyone as obedient slaves, you are slaves to the one whom you obey, either of sin, which leads to death, or of obedience, which leads to righteousness? So he's saying that every single human being is either going to be a slave to sin or a slave to God. That's it. We cannot have one foot in one camp and one in the other. He actually hits on that point in verse 20, okay, that we can't actually try to straddle the fence. He says that's impossible to do. And secondly, he's making the case that we cannot be in neither of those camps as well. We cannot be completely autonomous where we don't have any master, where we're our own master. As much as we like to think that's the case, that's not the reality. And Paul's explaining that before we were slaves to God, before we were in Christ, that every single one of us is actually a slave to sin. And that is the reality of who we are. Does that make sense? Tracking with me? Okay, so, so this is the reality. Now, as we progress through this, we're going to start progressing through this, and we're going to see how each one of these things produces these different results. The fruit of those things that leads to something that then produces this end result. Okay, so let's start looking through that. Um, jump down to verse 20. Jump down to verse 20. So he says, for when you were slaves of sin, you were free in regard to righteousness. But, when, but what fruit were you getting at that time from the things of which you are now ashamed? For the end of those things is death. 
So he's talking about when we were slaves to sin, when each of us was in that situation, that there was a type of fruit that was born out of that. Now, he doesn't specifically say it here, but it's implied all through this passage that the fruit of what it means to be a slave to sin is sin, right? It's evil deeds. It's, it's, it's uh, shameful works that produces this shame. That's what he says here. Look at that. In verse 21, he says, But what fruit were you getting at the time from the things of which you are now ashamed? So the fruit that we got was sin, which then led to shame. And then he says the end result of that is death. And then verse 22. But now that you have been set free from sin and have become slaves to God. So he's saying now that your allegiance has now changed from sin to God, that you're going to, re- you're going to start producing another fruit, which is good works. He says, look at this. The fruit you get, which leads to sanctification, which is the next one here, and its end, eternal life. So when we are slaves to sin, what comes out of our life, what's produced in our life is sin and evil deeds, which then leads to shame, which then leads to death. But then when we are slaves to God, when we have been transferred to the allegiance of God, when we have been designated as people to be devoted to his purposes, then that produces good works in us. That produces good works, which then leads to sanctification, that growing in holiness and devotion, which then leads to eternal life. And then he concludes the whole thing with the gospel. Look at verse 23. He says, for the wages of sin is death, but the free gift of God is eternal life in Christ Jesus our Lord. He reminds us that the means by which we get death when we are slaves to sin is that we earn it by our our works, that it's earned. That's what we deserved. That is the payment that we received for our evil deeds. But then, the way that, the means by which we receive eternal life is totally different. He says, the free gift of God is eternal life in Christ Jesus our Lord. That actually being transferred from being a slave to sin to being a slave to God is something that does not happen on our own. It's not something that we can do. There's no prayer we can pray. There's no good deeds that we can do that could get us that. But it only comes to us through the grace of God, that he has transferred our allegiance from sin to himself and designated us, purposed us for him, made us devoted for him and his purposes. This is the reality of who we are. So let's come back to our question. The question that Paul's trying to answer, right? He's trying to get to this whole idea of like, now that all the consequences of sin are gone, then why don't I just keep on sinning? Why don't I just keep on doing all the things that I want to do? Well, he's got two answers for us in here. The first is just a common sense answer. He's like, look, actually, throw the chart back up there again. Throw this back up. He's basically getting back to this. Like, If you want to keep on sinning, what's that going to lead to? It's going to lead to death. So right now, you've been transferred from death to life. You've been transferred from this allegiance from sin, allegiance to sin to an allegiance to God. Even if you could go back, why would you want to? Why would you even want to do that? Because the results of that is just going to lead to death. But the results that you have now is leading you towards eternal life. So that's his first argument. But his central argument, which is underneath all of that, is really an argument about identity. Because he's telling us that who you are has been completely changed. That who you are is no longer a slave to sin. You are no longer wrapped up in just having to do sinful, shameful actions and behaviors your entire life, but you have been set free from that so that you can be devoted to God, so that you have been purposed for Him. And so what he says is, is now live like that. Live like this now, because this is who you are. 
In another, in another letter, Paul even says that we are no longer the old creation that we were, but we are new creations. We're not even the old people that we used to be, but we have been completely transformed. And that's the reality. That's the spiritual reality of what has happened in the life of a believer. We have been so transformed that, that death is no longer a consequence for us but that we are living for him. We are purposed for him. So, I was trying to think of an illustration for this, and honestly, the Bible um, gives the best illustrations for itself. (laughs) So think about this. Go back to the Exodus again. In the Exodus, you have the people of God who are in slavery, right? They're in Egypt. They're in slavery to Pharaoh, and being in slavery, they are crying out to God, and God hears their cries, and he reaches down, and he redeems them out of slavery, and he takes them through the Red Sea and into the wilderness on the way to the mountain of God. And while they are on the way to the mountain of God, you have these two incidents that happen where the people of God begin to complain to Moses because they're hungry and they're thirsty. And what do they say? They say, it was better for us to be in Egypt than to die out here in the wilderness. They're like, we want to go back. We want to go back to slavery. And as, for us, as readers of this, we read this and we're like, oh my goodness, you guys are absolute fools. How could you possibly want to go back to that? How could you possibly want to, want to leave what God has done for you and go back into slavery and put yourself back in that position again? You guys, this is exactly Paul's point to us. That if we're going to say we just want to go back and keep on sinning, he's saying, Are you kidding me? That is the absolute stupidest thing you can do. Why, even if you could, why would you want to? Right? And then even the second point is illustrated. Because after they go through the wilderness and they finally get to the mountain of God and God gives Moses the law, right? The Ten Commandments and the rest of the law and God uh, gives that to him to go and give to the people. Now you guys remember when when we did the whole series on... uh, on the Ten Commandments, how every single one of those, we began by telling you guys that that God prefaced the whole Ten Commandments with grace. Okay? So Exodus chapter 20, verse 2, what does he do? He says, right from the very beginning, he says, I am the Lord your God who brought you out of the land of Egypt, out of the house of slavery. He reminds them about who they are. That God has rescued them and redeemed them from this terrible slavery that they were in. And now they're out of it. And then what's the first command? What's the first command? He says, you shall have no other gods before me. You guys, this is devotion to God. The first command is devotion and love for God that there should be no other gods before him. And this is echoed all throughout the Old Testament where over and over again, we see God going to his people and saying, I want to be your God and you will be my people, right? He says that over and over and over again. You will be my people and I will be your God. That the people of God have been rescued for a purpose. Church, let me tell you this today. That if you are in Christ, that if you are a follower of him, this is your story. This is exactly who you are. That you are a people who belong to God. That you've been rescued by God to be devoted to him. That you are no longer slaves to sin, but you have been rescued for righteousness, right? That you are no longer this... uh, person that is, that is really um, wait, waiting for the wrath of God to come upon them, but that you have been actually adopted as God's children and you have been cloaked in his righteousness, that this is the reality of who you are as a Christian, as God's people, and that you have been devoted to him, set apart for him. You are being made holy right now so that you could display the righteousness of God in your life. Now, 
Just a few points of application as we close. Number one is this question of who is our master. Now, some of you may be in this room and hearing this and you're thinking, okay, I, I, I get it. There's this idea of I can be a slave to sin or a slave to God. And I'm not really sure where I am. I'm not really sure what camp I'm in right now. Maybe you're in this position, position where you've been trying to keep one foot in each camp and try to straddle the fence. And as we've been talking, you may have been feeling convicted. I need, I need to get out of the, this, this camp. I need to make sure that I'm in the right camp here. I need to make sure that my allegiance is an allegiance to God. Well, let me tell you the solution to this problem. Because, again, there's nothing that you could do. There's nothing that you can say. There's no prayer you can pray. There's no good works that you can do that can change uh, really the way that God feels about you, the way that God loves you. But the reality is, is that he has sent his son for you. So that as we put our trust and our faith in him for what he's done, that he actually is the one that transfers our allegiance from sin to God. He's the one that does it. See, Jesus Christ, he put on flesh and he became man and he came down to earth to live a perfect life and then to die on a cross on our behalf so that the sin that we commit every single day, the sin that is in our life that permeates us all the way through, could be washed away. And not only that, but then he would then robe us in his righteousness so that one day when we stand before God, God would look at us and say, well done, my good and faithful servant, because he sees the righteousness of Christ on us. And so all we have to do is trust in that. We recognize that we are stuck as a slave to sin and that we need a Savior to rescue us out of that and we cry out to Jesus for help. And we trust in His plan for salvation for us. That is how we can get out of that mess. So if that's you today, I want to invite you to do that. To put your trust in Jesus Christ who saves you from your sin and transfers your allegiance from being a slave to sin to being devoted to God. Here's the second application. I think that through this, we can actually see evidence for our own salvation. Now, if you're a Christian, maybe you've struggled with this at times about wondering, am I really saved? Am I really like, is, does God really love me? Has he really done this for me? Well, I want to tell you today that I think that through sanctification, we can actually begin to see evidence of this in our life. And we can have assurance that God has redeemed us, that he has saved us. Let me explain. You see, as we, as we produce these good works in our life, and we become more and more obedient to God, we become more devoted to him in love and from that comes that fruit right of good works which leads to sanctification which leads to eternal life that those good works end up becoming evidence for us of, of the work of the holy spirit within us okay that actually becomes evidence of the transformation that has happened within us and so this is what paul says later and this is in second corinthians Chapter 1, he says, And it is God who establishes us with you in Christ and has anointed us and who has also put his seal on us and given us his spirit in our hearts as a guarantee, is what it says. As a guarantee. And so if we begin to see that fruit in our life, that God is changing us and there are good works that are being produced in our life, that that, that actually is assurance to us that God is working within us and that the Holy Spirit is within us who is our guarantee that he who began a good work in you will carry it on to completion until the day of Christ Jesus. That's the reality of it. And so if you've ever struggled with doubt about your own salvation, I want to ask you to look to your good works. 
and to say, wow, look at what God has done in me. Look at what he's produced in me. And I can be assured that he's going to continue this process until Jesus returns or until I die. Okay. Now, there's a third point of application, and it's related to the second one, but it's basically this. What if I haven't seen the fruit of sanctification in my life? Or maybe, what if it's been a while since I've seen this? I know there are many of us, actually, that struggle with this. There are many of us that are in that place where we're like, man, I, I remember growing in Christ when I was younger, and it just hasn't happened so much in a while, and, and I don't even know if I'm saved anymore. I don't even know if God still loves me. I've done so many bad things, and this is just this train wreck that's getting out of control. For most of us, I think it's because we're, we may be stuck in a sin. We may be stuck in something right now. And our minds are so focused on that one thing, and we keep asking God, God, why is this still here? Why is this thing still, still, still nagging me, still bothering me, still keeping me uh, under its control? And so I want to give you some assurance today that the fruit of sanctification isn't always going to be something where, where God is going to solve the problems that we want him to solve all the time. Now, sometimes those sins, and it certainly does not excuse the sin that we are in. God wants to eradicate that from your life, absolutely. But he may be working on some other things in your life first. He may be working in ways that you don't even see yet. Or right now you may be blinded to because of the sin that you're in. And as we expand that understanding of what it means to grow in holiness, to being devoted to God and growing in love and devotion to Him, as we expand that, that definition that we might be able to see that God is actually doing some incredible work in your life right now that, that maybe you just haven't seen or haven't been paying attention to. Are you growing in the knowledge of Him? Are you growing in your love and devotion for Him? Even more than that, let me, let me just tell you this. That sin that's in your life, are you growing to hate that sin more and more? Because if that's the case, let me tell you something. That is the work of God. That does not happen when we are slaves to sin. But that is the fruit of the Holy Spirit in your life right now. That He is transforming you and He is making you more into His image. Little by little. And so I want to ask you right now to trust that process. To trust that process. And to begin to cooperate with Him in that process. So that as we grow in holiness, what we begin to understand is that God, He's redeeming you for him. He wants you to be his people and he wants to be your God. I'm going to close today with a quote from Charles Spurgeon. As he closed one of his sermons, he gave this incredible message of assurance to us and he says this, he says, tell me then, sir, who did Christ die for? Will you answer me a question or two and I will tell you whether he has died for you? Do you need a Savior? Do you feel that you need a Savior? Are you this morning conscious of sin? Has the Holy Spirit taught you that you are lost? Then Christ died for you and you will be saved. Are you this morning conscious that you have no hope in the world but Christ? Do you feel that you of yourself cannot offer an atonement that can satisfy God's justice? Have you given up all confidence in yourselves? And can you say upon your bended knees, Lord, save or I perish? Well, then Christ died for you. If you're saying this morning, as I am as good as I ought to be, that I am as good as I ought to be, and I can get to heaven by my own good works, then remember that the scripture says of Jesus, I came not to call the righteous but sinners to repentance. So as long as you are in that state, I have no atonement to preach to you.
But if this morning you feel guilty, wretched, conscious of your guilt, and are ready to take Christ to be your only Savior, I can not only say to you that you may be saved, but what better still that you will be saved. This is the promise of God. Let's pray. Our Father, thank you so much for your gracious promise to us. And for all the benefits that comes with being converted. For not only justification where we are declared righteous, but for sanctification, Lord, where we are actually being made righteous. We're being made more holy. We're being made more like Christ. That this is a process that you do, Lord. This is a process that begins when you have changed us, when you have regenerated us and made us into new creations. Thank you for your spirit that does not leave us, but that exists within us and gives us all that we need for life and godliness in Christ Jesus. Thank you so much for the good works that you have planned for us, that we might walk in them as you have called us to. So Lord, help us. Help us to take hold of that promise that you have made to us, that we have been set free and justified in your sight, and that you are making us holy, a people that are devoted to God. And help us now, Lord, to walk in the good works that you have planned for us. We need your help, Lord. Help us today to have assurance that this work that you are doing in us will not fail because God, you never fail. But it is something that you have purposed to do and as you have set out to do it, it will be done. So Lord, we pray this in your name. Amen.